podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen only mode. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this seventh webinar on the secret teachings of all ages by Manly P. Hall. This and all subsequent webinars will be available on Makara.us. Just click on the MF webinars heading and you'll find the secret teachings link under its own subheading as shown here. Last month, we worked our way through the intro to chapter one, then began our study of the Druids. Let's take a look at some of the key points we've covered so far. Could we get a reader for this list? How about starting with Helen? Okay. Hello. The Druids were not a race or ethnic group, but rather an ethical and spiritually oriented mystery school of teacher priests who lived among the Celts. Though centered in England, this is where their arch Druids lived. They were also active in Ireland and Northern France, as well as other areas of Europe. There are many opinions about the source of the word Druid. Among them are the Celtic Druid, which means Oak Noah, the Welsh Drud, which means Absolver of Sins, and the Persian Duru, which means Good and Holy Man. Four, only two sources written as a result of direct contact with the Druids have come to light, one by Julius Caesar, the other by the Greek philosopher Poseidonius. The Druids themselves wrote nothing about their practices. The oak tree was central to Druid sacred practice, including a ritual harvesting of mistletoe by a golden sickle. And six, scholars hold that the Druidic beliefs were imported possibly from Carthage, Greece, or India. Thank you. Okay, with that, we'll pick up where we left off last time. Um, could we get a reader for this paragraph? Karen, would you be able to read, please? Sure. The proximity of the British Isles to the lost Atlantis may account for the sun worship, which plays an important part in the rituals of Druidism. Druidism. According to Arid Eratomodorus, Ceres and Persephone were worshipped on an island close to Britain with rites and ceremonies similar to those of, of uh, Samorothrace. There is no doubt that the Druidic pantheon includes a large number of Greek and Roman deities. This greatly amazed Caesar during his conquest of Britain and Gaul and caused him to affirm that these tribes adored Mercury, Apollo, Mars, and Jupiter in a manner similar to that of the Latin countries. It is almost certain that the Druidic mysteries were not indigenous to Britain or Gaul, but migrated from one of the more ancient civilizations. So, any thoughts or questions about this paragraph? Druid worship of Roman gods is well documented. It comes from a number of ancient sources. But it would be a mistake to think that just because the names and appearances of the Roman gods among the Druids were the same as those in Rome, that the meaning and importance ascribed to these gods by the Druids was also the same. For example, Zeus is never mentioned, but Mercury, an important but secondary god in Rome, was the most popular Roman god among the Druid-led Celts. Could we get a reader from this uh, for this passage? Keith, would you be able to read for us, please? You are self-muted. There you go. Hello. I'm going to start at the uh, Posidonius right there. Posidonius. Good. Posidonius has a great deal to say about Druid and Celt religion, but little about the actual gods of Gaul. He does mention, as we saw earlier, the frenzied women near the Loire River who worship a god like Greek Dionysus, 
but he offers no list of Celtic deities or descriptions of their powers. But to our good fortune, we do have just such a list from none other than Julius Caesar. The conqueror of Gaul was surprisingly interested in the religion of the people he defeated, perhaps as a result of his service as a priest in Rome. In any case, his short description of the Gaulish pantheon is the most detailed account of the Celtic gods we possess. The chief god of the Gaulish people is Mercury. There are images of him everywhere. They say he is the inventor of all art and a guide for every journey. He is also the protector of trade and business. After Mercury, they worship Apollo, Mars, Jupiter, and Minerva. These gods are in charge of the same areas of life as among other people. Apollo heals diseases. Minerva is the charge, is in charge of handicrafts. Jupiter rolls over the sky, and Mars is in charge of war. Our challenge 2,000 years later is to look carefully at this passage and try to understand the identity and role of these Gaulish gods using every tool we can muster, such as other classical references, archaeology, and with suitable caution, later Celtic mythology from Ireland and Wales. Thanks, Keith. Okay. Okay. Um, as we'll discover in this passage, there was also a completely different hierarchy of gods and goddesses that some, though not all, scholars associated with the Druids. So you have this uh, popular Roman gods among the Celts and the Celtic society, but the the um, priest class, the teachers, um, had a a more esoteric system, you could say. So could we get a reader for th this? Uh, and I have to say that this, that this, as well as much of what we'll read today, is, is informed speculation. Um, so go ahead. Okay. So, Lorraine, would you be able to read this, please? Yes. M. of Geneva maintains that the druidical system of the Irish divinities ascended from the lowest to the highest by a regular gradation of gods and goddesses till it reached the first great cause, that they formed a species of chain by which they were all connected together. The following are the gods as he gives them with their goddesses. God, and I'm not sure how to pronounce these, but Isar, goddess Axire, Anumathar, the first, uh, it's, it's like I, Ayeth. Number two, God, Ain, Eo, Anu, the second, Ayeth is, is the goddess. God Cirrus, goddess Sierra, god Lute, Lufe, goddess Eid or Ode, and uh, sorry, I guess this is also number four. Jemhar is the god, goddess Khan. So this is a triplicity under number five, is what we've got here. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, Dins as the god, goddess Seed. God Toth, goddess Bridget. Number six, god Neith, goddess Noth. Isar is called god or intelligent fire, Dia or Logue. Mr. Valencia says the word Logue means the spiritual flame. In a vast number of languages, the word Logue, standing for some idea relating to fire, is to be found. The word Isar in Irish literally means to kindle a fire. In Chaldean, to illuminate, Mr. Selden says, although Apollo, Mars, Mercury were worshipped among the vulgar Gauls, yet it appears that the Druids' invocation was to one all healing or all saving power. As fire was supposed to be the first principle of all things, it was also supposed by a peculiar refinement to be the destroyer, whence probably first arose the idea of the creator and the destroyer. Thank you. Well read. Yeah, it's a struggle to get through those god and goddess names. <laughs> Thank you, yes. So the quoted Mr. Selden here suggests that though the Roman pantheon made inroads among the general population, the Druidic order recognized a more esoteric hierarchy of deity. And you can certainly see the parallels uh, in theosophical ancient wisdom teachings. To, in fact, um, we see a parallel 
in Norse mythology where the Druidic supreme god of fire, Asar, became, becomes the Asir, the family name of their supreme solar deities, much like the Kumaras in Theosophy. In fact, they may be the Kumaras, for in Norse legend, the Asir were considered to be the self-appointed guardians of humankind, much as the Kumaras are in Theosophy. <clears throat> the Druidic Asar, the one all healing or all saving power, was also known as Belinus, or just Bel, though I suspect that Asar was a, a kind of numinal and thus cosmic form of Belinus, like the cosmic spiritual sun compared to the physical sun. Let's take a look at this quote from the Roman poet Osonius. <clears throat> referencing Bell, Bellinus. Could I get a reader for this? I'll read this. Priest of Bellinus, you who count amongst your ancestors the Druids of the Armorican people, you sprung from the race of the Druids, derive your sacred pedigree from the temple of Bellinus, and from thence is your name of Patera, for so the Apollonarian mystics call their ministers or priests. Thanks, Michael. So like Apollo, Bellinus or Bell was a solar deity. <clears throat> you know, it's sources like these that um, <clears throat> historians rely on the most to piece together Druidic history. Uh, this, this may be one of just a few <clears throat> one of just a few sources that mentions um, Bellinus as as a god and therefore uh, uh, allows us to associate uh, that deity with the with the druids. In this sculpture of Bellinus, the Indian influence influence is quite marked that kind of aura circle, which you see so often in Indian sculptures. Here is a much damaged trinity of unidentified deities from ancient Britain and a Celtic coin depicting Bellinus. That central god was very possibly defaced by um, later Christians. They were in the habit of doing that. <clears throat> So next up, can we get a reader for this paragraph? Scott, would you be able to read this, please? Sure. The school of the Druids was divided into three distinct parts. The secret teachings embodied therein are practically the same as the mysteries concealed under the allegories of Blue Lodge masonry. The lowest of the three divisions was that of the Ovate, this was an honorary degree, requiring no special purification or preparation. The Ovates dressed in green, the Druidic color of learning, and were expected to know something about medicine, astronomy, poetry if possible, and sometimes music. An Ovate was an individual admitted to the Druidic order because of his general excellence and superior knowledge concerning the problems of life. Thanks, Scott. So the Ovate MPH is suggesting would have been equivalent to the Masonic entered apprentice. But he also seems to suggest that because Ovate was an honorary title, strictly speaking, it stood outside the Druidic order. And another historian um, basically takes the position that there were really just true two, two levels within the within the Druids and that the Ovate um was bestowed on intrinsic merit rather than as a result of any kind of initiation uh, or preparation within the order notice by the way there's there's been a couple of of alignments with degree with a um, ray association for instance you know the the idea of active intelligence and of course association with nature uh, and the green is we see here, um, and the destructive aspect of ASAR 
we can certainly see it as a in a first rate uh, quality. D.W. Nash tells us that the ovates were a mixed class replenished from the ranks of the people. The cultivators of science and art, these occupied no mean position, though from the nature of their employments, they drew to themselves less observation. This is <clears throat> early 19th century writing, and you, you have to get used to that because a lot of the scholarly works on the Druids were from the first, and a lot of what's quoted today is from the first half of the 19th century. Okay, let's continue. Francis? Yeah. Uh, and Veronica has uh, written in that patera is a Greek word, and it means father. We also use it for our priests. Mm hmm sure. Yeah. So there'd be some recognition. Let's see, where does that appear? Is that back here? No. Perhaps the one before? Where did Patera appear? Yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, good observation. Um, <clears throat> so he's, um, Osonius is, you know, directly speaking to this priest. Um, <clears throat> and he says, you know, from your sacred pedigree, uh, you have, in a sense, earned the name Patera. Uh, for so the Op uh, Apollinarian mystic call their ministers or priests. So it's it's very central to this quote, this idea of Patera. And thanks for that uh, explanation, Father Pater, right? So. Okay, let's see. All right, so. Um, Scott has his hand raised. Go ahead, yeah. Scott. Going back to the Belenus, um, noting that the old lady uh, associates Bel with Shiva. Uh huh. And this Bel. Um, did you have the Bellinus here, I believe. Is, is that not from uh, Bath in England? Well, there's no reference in the writings I've read that I've read so far, but um, that, could well be. Anyway, um, associated with, with uh, Shiva, interesting. And what is that, what's that uh, reference to Bath? How does that? Um, well, just the, the carving that you have there of Bellinus. Oh, I, you think that's from the? I, from I Bath. think it's from Bath in England, but I'm not oh. sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It yeah, I really matter. Check that out. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we have, you know, a, another uh, very first ray orientation here. Interesting though, just in the the if you com compare a SAR, you know, uh, which is in a sense verified by the the more trackable Assyr of the Norse because they kept records a lot more than the Druids did. It's interesting to compare, you know, just, just the first letters and it's the overall sound of these two names, Asar or Asir and Bellinus. It's it's as though it's a stepped down form of the of the higher source or numinal source. But that's just my speculation. Okay. So, um, let's continue. Uh, we're talking now about the second division. Uh, could we get a, a reader for this, please? Lynn, would you be able to read this, please? Yes. The second division was that of Bard. Its members were robed in sky blue to represent harmony and truth, and to them was assigned the labor of memorizing, at least in part, the 20,000 verses of Druidic sacred poetry. They were often pictured with the primitive British or Irish harp, an instrument strung with human hair, and having as many strings as there were ribs on one side of the human body. <clears throat> These bards were often chosen as teachers of candidates seeking entrance 
into the Druidic mysteries. Neophytes wore striped robes of blue, green, and white, these being the three sacred colors of the Druidic order. Any thoughts or questions about this passage? So according to um, other historians, this was really the first division uh, of two. Um, Here's more info on the uh, on the bards uh, from a mid nineteenth century uh, source that I found uh, especially useful. Uh, could we get a a reader for this, please? Okay, Martha G, would you be able to read this, please? Sure. A bardic student wore a distinctive title. I we need. The indispensable qualifications for a scholar were noble birth and unimpeachable morals. On matriculation, he bound himself by oath not to reveal the mysteries into which he was about to be initiated. He was, however, seldom initiated into anything of importance until his understanding, affections, morals, and general character had undergone severe trials. He was closely observed when he was least aware of it. There was an eye to him invisible, continually fixed upon him. And from the knowledge thus obtained, an estimate was formed of his principles and abilities. Anawinid wore a plaid dress of the bardic colors, blue, green, and white. The candidate who had passed the ordeal was not immediately invested with the full privileges of the bardic order he became an inceptor or an inchoate bard under the title of Bard Kaw and wore for the first time the band of the order. Not till after he had presided at three Gorsodol or assemblies was he fully qualified to exercise all the functions of the office. A full bard could proclaim and hold a Gorsed, admit disciples, and Ovidian and instruct youth in the principles of religion and morality. The dress of the bard was unicolored of sky blue, an emblem of peace and truth. Jaleason or the bards who had written. Thanks, Martha. <clears throat> so any thoughts or questions about this? Quite illuminating, but uh, you know, I need to warn you that. Uh, this and most of what we're reading, including MPH, is what might be called informed speculation or extension off of, of less information that's what's given here. Um, you know, there is no stone tablet, you know, that is, has, you know, known to be from Druidic times that has this information inscribed on it. Um, you know, the best we have is Julius Caesar's writings, fragments from the Greek philosophers like Posidonius, Cicero, and Osonius. And a lot of the information is based on 10th century writings from the Welsh, Welsh triads. Um, for example, D.W. Nash, uh, in D.W. Nash's The Bards and Druids of Britain, we have a fifth century BC firsthand description from Diodorus Siculus. But even this source is quoting another source, now lost, which is that of Acadius the Milesian, right? So it's there's a lot of once, twice, thrice removed uh, and informed in speculation. But it's so consistent and uh, from multiple sources, when it's consistent and from multiple sources, I should say, we can start to build a picture, though, you know, you would be, um, wouldn't be a good idea to, uh, to make the argument that some precise detail is absolutely true. Okay. Here's a verse fragment from the fold. Oh, let's get a reader for this first. Helen, would you be able to read this, please? 
Among the Hyperboreans were men, priests as it were, of Apollo, constantly hymning lyric songs in his praise. Also in that island was a consecrated precinct of great magnificence, a temple of corresponding beauty in shape spherical, adorned with numerous dedicated gifts. Also a city sacred to the god, the majority of its inhabitants, harpers, who continually harping in the temple, sang lyrically hymns to the god, greatly magnifying his deeds. The Hyperboreans had a peculiar dialect and were very friendly disposed to the Hellenes, especially the Athenians and Delians. You know, so this is, you know, terrific information and it's from quite, it's from early enough that it's, you know, in 500 BC, the Druids were in full uh, expression. Um, but did Hecadius the Milesian uh, go to Britain? Well, that's not, you know, if there's no information saying that's true or not true. Um, did, who did he hear it from, you know? So it's, it just depends if you're approaching this as a, uh, you know, a rigorous historical study, you know, or as in a sense, the quote myth of the Druids. Okay, here is a verse fragment from the fold of the bards. It's short, but let's get a reader for this. Karen, could you read this for us, please? I am a harmonious one. I am a clear singer. I am steel. I am a druid. I am an artificer. I am a scientific one. I am a serpent. I am love. Quite a, evocative, isn't it? Um, and the fact that uh, poetry survives, some of it from later, but it's still expressive of that time, you know, suggest, uh, but doesn't prove um, certain aspects of Druidic culture. Francis? Yeah. Scott's hand is raised. Yeah. Go ahead, Scott. Uh, a couple things. Um, the old lady quotes this too, but in just two lines of it, and her two lines that I came across, and she says, uh, I am a snake. I am a druid. Oh, um, yeah. Okay. Same, yeah. obviously the same source. Um, and the other thing was about the Hyperboreans. You know, remember the Hyperboreans in theosophical lore are a first race. Um, they're far older than the Druids. So this is, and lived in the North and, and dealt with an Athens that we know nothing of, that's spoken of as being far more ancient than the Athens we, we speak of, the classical Athens. Um, so I think the last slide you had there was, was conflating the more really modern Druids, as it were, to the really truly ancient Hyperboreans of another continent at the North Pole. Um, right. So it, anyway, it's, it's, it's just talking, even with Diodorus being that old, um, they are either had conflated it themselves or were hiding it. I don't know. Yeah, this is, I, Hyperboreans just go way back to the north and the land uh, where the sun never sets, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and, you know, they found um, evidence of, you know, plant life buried in the ice up in, in the north. Uh, yeah. And this would suggest certainly a time before the Ice Age, uh, very probably a time, you know, when there was a previous magnetic shift of the poles, which really since this far back, you know, like um, uh, the theosophical dating of the uh, of the Sphinx and the pyramids, you know, also is, is from this earlier time. And um, so it's interesting, yeah, there, and, and we can't know where the conflation, you know, occurs. Um, like you say, it's because it's only in we had the same problem when we look at the the temples of uh, such as Stonehenge, you know, uh, which could be uh, from a 
a civilization that coexisted with the Hyperboreans, you know, the, the, the so-called giants, um, you know, uh, uh, could have been very much connected with that civilization. But that doesn't mean that the Druids um, didn't use those temples, recognize and use them, uh, though that's um, at least according to uh, one theosophical thought, um, they didn't build them. You know, so you have that same kind of, um, you know, disparity between the two ancient civilizations. And of course, the problem being that we have no direct archaeological evidence or certainly not any writings from these periods. Right. And the Hyperborean stuff is, we're coming back around to that, it seems, with climate change, recognizing that the North Pole was once on the equator. Hmm. Yeah. that the earth has flipped several times that's part part of theosophical teaching as well and that's why it was you find the the palm trees at the north pole because it wasn't at the north pole when they were growing there um yeah, so hyperborean and whatnot i mean it's like comparing the ancient egyptians we know of to the really ancient atlanteans and saying they were the same no no yeah but it may have been sourced somewhat but not the same right and there's actually some recent uh, measurements of the magnetosphere that suggest that such a change, um, such a shift could be in the offing. Uh, so there's, you know, there's some science ar around this, but that science is not archaeology. No. Okay. Let's see. We just did this. Um, up next, um, moving on to the third division, or from another point of view, the second. Uh, could we get a reader for this? Keith, would you be able to read this, please? Yourself muted. There you go. There we got it. it figured out. It takes a second. The third division was that of Druid, Druidum. Its particular labor was to minister to the religious needs of the people. To reach this dignity, the candidate must first become a bard brink. The Druids always dressed in white, symbolic of their purity, and the color used by them to symbolize the sun. In order to reach the exalted position of Archdruid, or spiritual head of the organization, it was necessary for a priest to pass through the six successive degrees of the Druidic order. The members of the different degrees were differentiated by the colors of their sashes, for all of them were robes of white. Some writers are of the opinion that the title of Archdruid was hereditary, descending from father to son, but it is more probable that the honor was conferred by ballot election. Its recipient was chosen for his virtues and integrity for the most learned members of the higher druidic degrees. Any thoughts about this or questions? Well, Anne Veronica has written another comment. Okay. Uh, I once read that the structure of the Greek language, its form and mat maturity indicates that it is much older than we believe it to be. Interesting. Uh huh. Okay, so that you know that references you know that um, Athens of the uh, hyper hyperbolean reference. You know, hyper is that what it is? Hyper what? Hyperborean. Hyperborean. Yeah, the hyperborean reference that it was a different Athens, possibly you know that older Greek who references that. Um, and, and, and Scott's hand is raised again. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, Scott. Uh, in my little bit of research on the Druids here, I, I came across something that you haven't covered. It kind of conflicts, but I don't know what you've come up with. Uh, but I, I came up with, uh, came across there was there were the three um, groups. Um, and one of them, it was not the Ovates, it was called the Vates, it may be the same, but they were listed as the soothsayers, diviners, and natural philosophers of the Druidic people. 
and not so it suggests not that they were on the outer temple, um, but something within. But I don't know. Yeah. Do you have anything that comes up with with uh, being um, the diviners yeah. and soothsayers in particular group? Other than no. The Druid? No. In fact, I um, if they were the, I would put the diviners and soothsayers in the first group of the druids themselves, um, not certainly not in the third, but this this third, this, uh, which recognized, you could say, recognized those who had attained outside the order. Well, you know, that's a broad spectrum. So it could be that, you know, um, someone who had developed these abilities on their own would be recognized uh, for that and be given this, you know, honorary title of, of Ovate or Vate, but I can't, uh, I can't address this any more than that. Okay, um, let's see what we find out in here. Here's some more detailed, but again, partly speculative description of this highest class. Um, is that where we're? Yeah, highest class within the Druidic order. Can we get a reader for this? Just a minute. Martha raised a question. Was yeah. steel was steel invented then? It is a complex alloy. <laughs> Very good. Uh, yeah, that's really interesting. It's certainly not anything that we would call steel now. This, you know, that I would then get into the etymology of the term because maybe the the uh, noun steel existed before what modern steel um, uh, describes as steel, which is, uh, you know, there's elements to it like molybdenum that are required to make iron into steel. Um, but maybe there was a different kind of steel. I don't know. Does anyone know? I see a hand raise. Uh, Martha, ha Martha has also written the entire history of steel from hunks of iron streaking through the sky to the construction of skyscrapers and megastructures. This is the history of the world's greatest alloy. The entire history of steel by Jonathan Schiffman, July 9, 2018. Oh, really? Huh. Well, he probably answers this question as to when steel per se was invented. I'm thinking it's, it's a later invention that what we normally associate uh, with druids certainly interesting yeah. yeah and of course you know it also shows um you know i wish i had uh, done a copy paste of the original language um uh which is very different uh, looking this is obviously an english translation and so this could be in the translation rather than in the original, this, this word steel. Yeah, and, go ahead. And Scott's hand is raised. Go ahead, Scott. I was going to say the same thing. This is, seems to me a very clumsy uh, modern translation. If this is the Druidic song by the bards, you know it's going to be beautiful and lyrical. It's not going to be harmonious one, clear singer, steel, scientific one. No, no, no. This is a bad translation of yeah the concepts come through but there's you know there's something very definitely lost or added in the translation yeah the rhythm is gone completely totally you know yeah. so yeah i i agree with you on that <laughs> um okay Let's see where we are here come back um we were about to read this and Lorraine, are you able to read this, please? Yes. The Druids were the second order, but it was necessary to pass through the first to reach it. That is to say, a Druid must have been a bard, though it was by no means required that a bard should be a Druid. The Druids were priests and judges. This union in their persons of the sacerdotal and judicial functions gave them great weight and authority and caused their office to be in much request. The place of meeting of the Druids was called Gudfa, which was, as the name implies, a place of presence, an eminence either natural or artificial, according to the conveniency of the situation. 
a white robe emblematic of truth and holiness, and also of the solar light, was the distinguishing dress of the Druids. The judicial habit of the Archdruid was splendid and imposing. He was clothed in a stole of virgin white over a closer robe of the same, fastened by a girdle on which appeared the crystal of augury encased in gold. Round his neck was the breastplate of judgment, said to possess the salutary but uncomfortable property of squeezing the neck on the utterance of a corrupt judgment. Below the breastplate was suspended the glane nadir, or serpent's jewel. On his head he had a tiara of gold. On each of two fingers of his right hand he wore a ring, one plain, the other, the chain ring of divination. As he stood beside the stone altar, his hand rested on the elucidator, which consisted of several staves called colbrennan, omen sticks, on which the judicial maxims were cut, and which, being put into a frame, were turned at pleasure, so that each stave represented a triplet when, for, when formed of three sides. Okay, any thoughts or questions about this? This is one of the oldest existing drawings of a druid there on the left from 1676. Going back to the conversation about steel, Karsten writes, probably iron instead of steel. And Alexandros writes, steel equals stock law equals to be firm. Yeah, said see, I think that's that's more like it. Uh, you know, because steely, you know, to you know, or to be steeled for a situation in order to have a steely presence, you know, all those suggest quality rather than this specific composition of of you know this substance. Uh, so I think that's very much more likely uh, the source of, of yeah, this, this poem here, right? But as Scott said, you don't want to put that much stock in the, um, in the specific translation here. Um, however, the, there is great potency in the concepts, right? Okay, good. Um, and here's some more info on the Archdruids. Could we get a reader for this? I'll read this one. The Archdruid commanded the armies of his country. They were looked up to with the most profound veneration, and the persons of the chiefs of the order were held sacred, so that their power was enormous, and at times when they chose to exercise it, they domineered over both people and kings. The effect of the power of excommunication which they possessed was attended with consequences as extensive as those of the excommunication of the Roman Church. In the utmost plentitude of its power, a power which, in fact, laid all orders of the state prostrate at their feet. Thanks. Michael. So here's, uh, let's take a look at the image and text at the center of, of page 22. Um, can we get a reader for this, please? It's also more about the Archdruid. Can you read this for us, Scott? All right. The most striking adornment of the Archdruid was the Eidhan Moran, Moran, or breastplate, breastplate of Judgment, which possessed the mysterious power of strangling any who made an untrue statement while wearing it. Godfrey Higgins states that this breastplate was put on the necks of witnesses to testify the veracity of their evidence. The Druidic tiara, or anguinum, is, in, is front embossed with a number of points to represent the sun's rays, indicated that the priest was the personification of the rising sun. On the front of his belt, the archdruid wore the lithe mycet, I don't know, a magic bro brooch, brooch or buckle on the center of which was a large white stone. To this was attributed the power of drawing the fire of the gods down from heaven at the priest's command. The specially cut stone was a burning glass by which the sun's rays were concentrated to light the altar fires. 
The Druids also had another symbol had other symbolic implements, such as the peculiarly shaped golden sickle, with which they cut the mistletoe from the oak, and the cornen or scepter, in the form of a crescent, symbolic of the sixth day of the increasing moon, and also of the Ark of Noah. An early initiate of the Druidic mysteries related that admission to their midnight ceremony was gained by means of a glass boat called the Grig Grindendrin. This boat symbolized the moon, which floating upon the waters of eternity preserved the seeds of living creature with, creatures within its boat-like crescent. Thanks, Scott. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, here's an illustration of the Iodon Moran, the breastplate of judgment. And I have to say, and all my other, all the other sources I read about this, if you look up at the top of this, uh, it says here it possessed mysterious power of strangling any who made an untrue statement. That's not, um, nowhere else was that mentioned. What it did say was that, that it would apply pressure around the neck of the arch druid if, uh, he were about to make an, uh, an untrue judgment or an unjust judgment. And that really puts the shoe on the other foot. It's a very, uh, very, very different kind of thing. Instead of an instrument of torture, it becomes, you know, an, an instrument of guidance. And, uh, you know, I, of course, I prefer to think the second is, is the true, especially since it had this particular kind of magical potency, um, you know, but of course all this would seem to be completely lost, except for we have this extraordinary thing, which in Thomas Moore's The History of Ireland, we have cited further evidence of the existence of this breastplate. Quote, in an Irish fable, uh, Moore, um, Moran was the chief judge of Federach, the just, and early king of Ireland before the Christian era. The caller is said to have given warning by increased pressure around the neck of the wearer whenever he was about to pronounce an unjust sentence. This seems like a fanciful story, but according to Keating, quote, when pulled forth, it was evidence that the object was the Iodan Moran, the breastplate of judgment. It was found 12 feet deep in a turf bog in the county of Limerick on the estate of Mr. Burry and is now in the possession of Mrs. Burry of Granby Row, Dublin. According to Higgins, it was this breastplate that is here illustrated. So this is one of those extraordinary links between the uh, near present, this would have been middle of the last century, and the ancient Druids. I tried to find uh, corroborating evidence of the, you know, uh, looking up, you know, um, the county of Limerick and the estate of Mr. Burry. Uh, I couldn't find anything, um, but that doesn't mean it's not true. Who knows? Um, Anyway, any thoughts about this extraordinary uh, Iodan Moran? The, okay, we got a hand. Michael, who's the hand belong to? Um, Jonathan, I'm trying to unmute you. There? Hi. There you are. I had a question about the um, about the shape and uh, the position that this device is on the person, how it um, goes down um, across the throat chakra, pretty much hmm. um, the heart chakra. You know, it comes down um, pretty much around the solar plexus. You know, and on each side, I'm just wondering if there's a correlation to you know the positioning. Uh, well, of course, there's, <laughs> you know, there's no information uh, about what you're asking. Um, mm -hmm. So, all, you know, all we can do is look at the shape. Now, you have this shape, 
which would seem to suggest the slack position. And then we have this shape, which is, even though it's more detailed, it's quite different than, than this, you know. And I'm I'm just uh, yeah I'm really fascinated by um, just where it's placed on the body I guess yeah it is I, like for instance this one you know would cover the the heart if you if you you know think in terms of DK's position of the heart chakra which is more between the shoulder blades than down at the heart it would certainly be covered by this and the throat you know because it's, you know given this it would seem to fit pretty snugly around the neck. Um, and then you have these two kind of resonators or mm -hmm. something. Yes. You know, what is that about? It's, you know, we, it's a speculative conversation. And, and then what makes it moves? Is, is there a mechanical device that turns this into this, you know, where it's slack and then it pulls up suddenly and starts, you know, uh, creating more pressure around the neck? Um, you know, what's that mechanism? It seems to me that that would definitely have to be magical in, in its property. But there's no, there's no more information given. So I can't actually answer your question, but that doesn't prohibit us from, you know, speculating, because that's what most of this. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. And uh, Alexandros has had uh, a couple of written comments. Mm -hmm. uh, Patera uh, equals Pitara equals Petri. Petris of sky and Petris of earth. And then wow. another Borean equals the land of the wild boar. Boar equals Barahi equals Vri equals Varuna equals cover protect. And then Anne Veronica writes, there are two small chakras outlet left and right of the throat. Wow. Yeah. I was wondering about that, you know, um, if that wasn't an energetic, you know, it's almost like an energetic magnifier. Uh, it seems like that. And, and, uh, and that, so the mechanism for closing it could come from the, unconscious slash superconscious um, mechanism in the throat chakras that would then activate or act on, you know, this extraordinary mechanism. You know, it's, it's to take the broad view on something like this, you know, if such a mechanism existed and it's certainly suggested by this discovery, um, then if you were to then um, speculate as to the level of, of consciousness, the level of, of um, instrumentality of the Druidic culture, it's certainly well beyond primitive and would seem to be informed with uh, in, uh, esoteric um, understanding. You know, you, it's, you can't make specific, you can't draw specific conclusions, but you can, you can certainly draw, I think, uh, appropriate inferences when you run across, you know, something like this. Okay. And, Keith, and Keith adds, the carotid arteries and glands are on either side of the throat and are connected with the alta major center. Mm, yeah. And, and, and interestingly, in some research I did in a Scientific American magazine from um, late 1800s, early 1900s, there was an article about the carotid glands, uh, which were on either side and associated with the division of the carotid arteries uh -huh. on either side of the throat. Interesting. Yeah. So, you know, it could be, it could be associated with that and it could be both. It could be those, um, those etheric centers uh, that were mentioned on either side of the throat centers and those could have something to do with uh, the carotid, um, who knows. Uh, but it, it does seem 
um, uh, just it's just very evocative, you know, to uh, look at this design and the you could say mythology around its use. And then we discovered that one was discovered. Oh, we think it's possible, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, usually what you get is pieces to the puzzle, and we get maybe a little more pieces than is usual with this. Okay. Lynn asks, found deep in a bog, is this where a body would be buried? Thinking that it was worn by a druid, where did they bury the dead? Yeah. Um, I found no information about how they dealt with the deceased. I would think it, they would be cremated, you know, given the rest of their orientation. But um, we have, they have found no, um, uh, they have found no bodies that could definitely be uh, dated to that period. So we don't really know. However, they have found a number of bodies um, that have been preserved by Pete. Uh, and you've probably read about these, and they're they're quite old. In fact, there's some that were so. There was one in particular that was so well preserved that the police were called, and uh, and they got they started an investigation. Uh, you know, um, going around the local community and questioning people until uh, somebody came out and identified it as being over two thousand years old. So it's it's an extraordinary preservative agent. They've also found animals about from uh, earlier times in this bog. So you know it's very possible that um, you know uh, that a a druid was um, buried with this um, this item around his neck. This um, you know. Iodan Moran around his neck, and that that's all that remained, or it shifted off of that person. Who knows? You know, it's certainly possible. And then Lynn adds another question. Also, the Ark of Noah. Does that relate them with the deluge? Yeah, there's actually a lot written. I didn't get into it because MPH doesn't mention it. But uh, in reading these sources about the Druids, they had a really strong mythology around the deluge. And in fact, their mountaintop um, temples were considered to be boats that, um, see, they called them, what did they call the Ark of something? Can't remember. Um, that were, you know, vibrationally um, um, protective of the energy of this of this deluge so there was the actual deluge which which they chronicle um, and then there was there's a ceremonial deluge uh, because water was the uh, they was known to be the primary element in druidic belief and of course I, I think this is the that primal um, mula prakriti the waters of space that is referenced you know so um it's just fragments and uh but we do have the evidence that these hilltop um enclosed temples were considered to be uh protective boats um so obviously <laughs> you know a rock enclosure doesn't float so it's going to be ceremonial uh um in nature. Anyone else? Okay, yeah. I see no hands and other okay. questions. The reference to a glass boat called Sirig Guidrin, oh, who knows what CWRWG is pronounced as. Uh, described by Douglas, is further described by Douglas Monroe in his book, The 21 Lessons of Merlin. He states, I'll just read this, the second is the veil of Sithral, the ghost, 
through which one must pass to achieve blessedness in Gwynedd, the world of the twice born. Its symbol is this Quigrig Gwydrin, the boat of glass, for navigating the in between realms of the other world. Here's another reference to this boat of glass. And can we get a reader for this? And Veronica, would you be able to read this for us, please? Yeah. There you Hi. go. Hello. Gavren, Guadvalon, and Gwendalo were the heads, we are told, of the three faithful tribes of Britain. The family of Gavren obtained that title by accompanying him to sea to discover some islands, which by a traditional memorial were known by the name of the Green Islands of the Ocean. This expedition was not heard of afterwards, and the situations of the islands became lost to the Britons. The legend is closely allied to the voyage of Melon and his bards in the boat of glass. It originated from the circumstance of some aspirants being cast away while undergoing the process of the navicular in initiation into the mysteries. The origin of the pagan idol idolatry. Idolatry, yes. Thank you. Idolatry. Thank you. Mm. Okay. Um, so I've referenced Douglas Monroe's book for two reasons. First, um, it makes sense that a lunar glass boat would be used as a metaphor for navigating uh, the astral plane or the unseen realms, the quote, second veil. But I'm also including this quote to give an example of the fourth category of reference material about the Druids, that of new age imaginative, but not necessarily accurate writing. When the authors of these works are intuitively driven, those works can stimulate our imaginations. But generally, it's best to take these writings with you know, more than a grain of salt. But in defense of these imaginatively derived writings, I will say that in our quest for the truth, uh, we do well to remember that at least in my experience, life offers up experiences that far exceed any contrived fantasy. Thus, in my humble opinion, the realities of the Druidic practices very likely far exceed any imaginary musings we may have about them. So we may be wrong in, in the specifics, but um, I, I believe this was a highly evolved esoteric uh, order. That's just you know, my understanding, my opinion. Okay, okay, Jonathan's hand is raised. Go ahead, Jonathan. Um, yeah, just to go go back just one, one or two pages, you know, I just, I guess I'm still stuck on that that one. Um, the uh, the device around the neck. I I think that was it was kind of I was relating it to the south node of the moon, the shape of the south node, and it, uh -huh. how it says the um, um. There's a lot of like you know moon connotations in there, so I just it was putting those together. Yeah, that's an interesting observation. And the there was a tremendous amount of lunar worship. We're seeing it even here, right? I mean, this this whole idea of a glass boat, you know, if you if you take the the moon in its earliest waxing stages, the sickle moon, you know, that's mm. um certainly a reference to what could be metaphorically considered as a glass boat, you know, riding on the oceans of space. Yes, yes. Um, and to make a glass float, actually, you would have to put air inside the glass. Yeah, right, exactly. So, you know, even making it more of a metaphor. Um, I certain, love it. It's so, it's beautiful. Yeah, it is. And, yeah, no one made a real glass boat. No one in the right mind. You mm -hmm. know? 
would make a real glass boat. That's not what's happening here. In fact, metaphors are supposed to also indicate in the metaphor that they're not, they don't work in physical plane reality. That's part of the metaphorical, metaphorical quality. Or another way to look at it is part of the blind of um, you know, such a device, right? Mm -hmm. So thanks for that. Yeah, the, I like that. It really does look like the South Moon, doesn't it? Look at that. Well, yes. Um... And it's almost like, you know, for the, the, the way the device works, it's almost like, you know, it moves in a direction, you know, the south node. You're coming from a direction and going towards mm -hmm. the northern, you know what I'm saying? Um, mm -hmm. It's kind of like, you know, your gut instinct almost. Um, yeah. It harnesses your gut instinct. That's, I'm just speculating, obviously. Yeah, no, but I, I like almost, almost feel the, the harnessing of a gut instinct from that south node up mm. to the northern node and it almost stops you like you're going back and saying hey yeah um, th there is a more uh, there's more truth to what you're doing you know from you know what you're the lessons you've already known you know what i'm saying uh, i just, yeah. if i can explain that how how it works a little bit yeah i mean can you imagine being such a one and then suddenly having this you know you're about to pronounce you know, uh, some verdict, and then this thing tightens around your neck. Mm -hmm. I mean, just imagine. You know, I am. A, I'm totally imagining, and I <laughs> just. I mean, I'm fascinated with um, you know, design yeah. and um, you know, just way things work. You know, especially um, right. devices. You know, ancient devices. I yeah, um, the power behind yeah. them. But I mean, just the thought behind them uh, is first. Yeah, especially ones that bridge, you know, the what we call the practical world where devices usually function, and you know the level of the unconscious, or as you say, that south lunar uh, node. Um, in, it's, you know, you could. Is it intuitive? Is it subconscious? Is you know what's going on there? But it's uh, it's the concept is. Uh, fascinating really i i definitely would look into this a little bit more thank you very much yeah yeah well do it uh do a search for you know this um where is it you can write it down there i have it all written thank you <laughs> Go down moran you know okay moving on <laughs> yeah moving on thank you and yeah. and we've got some more comments uh and Veronica wants to know what you mean by South Node. Oh, when it, I, I'd like an astrologer to explain that. I, I'm not an astrologer, uh, so uh, I'm less versed. Uh, could someone who has some understanding in that um, uh, describe it? Perhaps Scott, could you? If, uh, there no you go, else. Scott. <laughs> okay, um, it it deals with the um, the orbit orbit of the moon as it crosses the ecliptic at a northern point and a southern point of input and output. I think of the north node and south node is is like what you see on on a globe, a north pole and a south pole. The north being an input, and the south put an output. South south uh, node, south pole and output. And when I look at this archjewed. What does he have on his head? A solar crown through his head, through his centers, down to a lunar output. I like the south node idea. Whether those things actually sat up there or there were counterpoises that went over the shoulders and held it onto his neck, I don't know. Um, but there's an input and output suggested between the top of his head and the throat center, what he speaks, what income and outgo. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much for that. That's, you know, the tiara, you know, crowns in ancient times were also devices um, of of input, you know, because they were uh, initiates that were at this level. Certainly, um, if we're to believe, you know, the the mythology of the Druid to this point, we would have to ascribe the arch Druid as being a high initiate. If not a master of wisdom, you know, I would think, um, you know, very likely, huh? And um, 
in which case this crown would be uh, a, a, a way of um, intensifying the, re the, the reception. Uh, yeah, I, I really like your ideas around that. Yeah. I'm and surprised the, MPH missed that because that's <laughs> that's really another esoteric level in, you know, you you do you have like a, a a north and south node kind of thing going on here. I mean, look at in this drawing how symmetrical the two are, you know, and yet different. You know, you have the the two circles on either side of of almost like a figure eight, you know, very interesting. Yeah, go ahead, Michael. Yes, returning to the boat. Mm -hmm. Ann Veronica writes, this boat reminded me of the boat the dead passed in ancient Greece to go to the underworld, Addis. When they buried their dead, they used to put money on the dead to give to the man who had the boat and navigated to and from the underworld. Right, across the River Styx, indeed. Yes, indeed. Yeah, and thanks for that reference. Um, and, you know, initiates, you know, who uh, travel by such a, a boat have to have the power to uh, control it, basically, uh, to take it where they want to go rather than um, across, you know, the river Styx, which is its normal path, you could say. So when when a normal mortal dies and they have an experience of this boat, it's only it's taking them from the uh, conscious living realm to the to the realm of the deceased. But initiates can use that's why they're called adepts. They're adept at using these tools in other ways. This is a good observation. Thank you. And then Lynn writes. Three faithful tribes of Britain seems to give a hint of those chosen humans fleeing from the deluge. Yeah, it does. It's, you know, it's, yeah. These, and, you know, this mountaintop temples uh, that are surrounded by stonework uh, could be a reference, you know, to the, um, remember they just, they, <laughs> There was one school of thought that the um, Noah's Ark was discovered on that mountain um, somewhere in the um, Near East, I believe. Um, and, you know, that it, and of course, in the original biblical writing, it, it to land, it settled on a mountaintop, you know, before the receding of the waters. So, it, you know, could very much be a reference to that. Um, actual historical event from um, millennia before. It's that that connection, you know, the, between the Hyperborean and the, the Druidic. Okay, anything else before we go on? Alexandros uh, writes, no, this boat is for the land of Twiceborn. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, it's a metaphor for navigating the unseen realms. So there's there's many places that such a, uh, a vehicle um, can go, and the twice born become adepts at at this uh, what's called navicular navicular initiation, right? And there's a very specific the uh, initiation, the last, the third, the, wherein they were literally put on uh, boats and sent out to sea and had to survive. And most, not some, most didn't survive it. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Moving on to Martha's comment. Limerick is where the Galti Mountains are, southern Ireland. Neighboring counties, Cork, Kerry, a breadbasket where older cultures thrived. Uh, so it was right in, it was in the right place um, for a genuine uh, Eodan Moran to be found. And then uh, N uh, writes, 
Moran device refers to the need to receive judgment rather than to make judgment, hence connection to South Node. Yes. Yeah, that was the point I was making earlier. Yeah, it's a, yeah, exactly. And Lorraine has her hand raised. You are self-muted. Yes. yes, Lorraine. You're self-muted, Lorraine. Just click on the microphone, one click, and it'll go green, and then you'll be able to speak. Okay, terrific. Sorry about that. Yeah, I had unmuted, I think, probably at the same moment that Michael tried to unmute me, so I ended up muting again, but we're good now. Um, okay. I'm not a professional astrologer. I'm learning, uh, studying astrology, but I wanted to comment on the south node, the north node, and, you know, maybe this is this is incorrect i certainly stand to be corrected um my understanding from an evolutionary perspective is that the south node represents um older tendencies tendency that need to be overcome in the evolutionary process whereas the north node represents um perhaps next steps for us in our evolutionary process which to put it one way if we talk about it in terms of the egoic lotus perhaps the south node would represent patterns encoded in the base of the lotus and the permanent atoms from prior lifetimes they may be what we call positive or negative doesn't matter either way they're they're encoded there they're to be utilized either to overcome or use as a strength either way whereas the north node might then represent energies from uh petals that we're working on opening um our future path what will move us onward so I just wanted to comment on that. I'd certainly welcome any feedback on that, but that's been, been my understanding at, at, at this point in my studies. Okay, and to translate that into the um, possible use by an archdruid of the Eodon Moran, we could say that the south mode node would then uh, represent that which is below the threshold of consciousness, and the north node would represent um, the super conscious realms. Therefore, it, he would be, um, in a sense, guided by both, right? Um, the, his own head centers would be the conscious realm, but the south node could then literally physically warn him from an instinctual place. And of course, instinct is also a something that moves it's not, it's not just the amphibian brain right it's the or the reptilian i should say the reptilian brain but it is that which is below the level of your current consciousness so for a master of wisdom whose language is the intuition the um uh the lower mind becomes you know below the uh b below that threshold so um, this could just be the a functional aspect to bring that forth. Yes, yes, I think so. Um, in terms of it being the the below the conscious level, absolutely. And and even if we just talk about it in terms of the lotus for for any evolving individual, that often comes from um, below the conscious awareness issues from a prior lifetime until we reach the point where we can deal with them consciously. And the conscious mind is perhaps the link between those two. Um, utilizing those strengths and using it to move into the future. And, and the arch druid uh, could do the same, draw upon his prior uh, awarenesses, whether or not he's conscious that they came from another lifetime, but draw upon them to make whatever decision, uh, et cetera, needs to be made in the present. Hopefully that will be a, a forward-looking one, one that, that doesn't uh, <clears throat> cause the, the neck piece there to, to constrict in, in reaction. Yeah. yeah. And, and, yeah. You can't help but think that, you know, a true master of wisdom wouldn't need either of these, who wouldn't need a tiara, wouldn't need this Eodan Moran, you know, that it would then become ceremonially representative of those inherent capabilities, able to draw all from all that has come before and and from the higher realms as, as well, um, it, rather than being actual mechanisms you know i mean that's that's just a, another way or another possibility 
But on the way there, on the way to that state of consciousness, these could be, you know, amplifiers of those potencies. Yes. Really fascinating stuff. Wow, huh? Yeah. Um, and we didn't really even touch on some of these, the, uh, some of these other ideas, you know, like the the Lias Mississif, this magic brute, brute, right, uh, which could draw fire down from heaven at the priest's command. You know, what is that about, and um, uh, and for what purposes? Besides just being a lens that could concentrate fire on, on you know, for altars, and because you know the the. Uh, the right to start a fire was considered to be the province of the Druids. And uh, there was one day of the year, um, can't remember which day, um, where you, if you started a fire without going to the Druids and, and having them start it for you, uh, it was punishable by death. Hey, a lot of things were punishable by death, you know, um, in those days, um, or so it is recorded. But uh, this was to restate, reaffirm the fact that all, uh, that the sacred source of fire came through the Druidic order, right? So once a year, one day of the year, they all had, all fires had to be started by this class of Druids. Okay. Francis, staying on this breastplate, the Moran. <laughs> Karsten writes, what about Kabbalah, the Chokma, Uranus, Ray 1, on left ear, and Bina, Saturn, Ray 3, on the right ear? The six rings around the heart, the sun, Christ, Ray 2, on the top as Kether. Uh, well, it's, you know, it's a beautiful idea. It's just another way of looking at it. You could, yeah, then what would happen is the um, the tiara and the two side would become the higher triad of the tree of life, you know, uh, Kether, uh, Bina, and Chokma. Interesting, Chokma for the, anyway. Uh, and then the the rings below that could represent, you know, the, the, the lower, um, seven, but six, because the seventh Malkuth is not considered a principle. It is actually dropped down from the tree of life. Let's look at this. Wait a minute, it's up here. Yeah, here we go. How many we got? One, two, three, four, five, six, right? Yeah, so it could be, yeah, yeah these could represent, you know, eight of the nine and that the tiara would be the highest Kether ninth, you know. It's, it's interesting, when you have a mechanism that functions within the realm of truth, then you get this lineup of um, a affirmative um, systems, like for instance, the tree of life in this. Does that mean that it was taught by them or even known by them? Who knows, right? But it lines up. Um, so yeah. You could even see the belt, the circle and the belt buckle as that dropped 10th Malkuth, right? Who knows? Continuing on with the same subject, N yeah. writes, in this My context, favorite. the Moran South Node refers to the Archdruid as being a receptacle of wisdom or intuition rather than mind and persona North Mode. Uh, uh -huh. Yes. The, the, and the, you know, the key word there is receptacle. The one who demonstrates potency uh, is a vehicle. And so it could be, you could say, the ceremonial aspect of the druid at large as a vehicle, right? So, yeah, I like that. It's a further expansion. Uh, this is what I live for, folks, this kind of expansion um, you know, beyond what's written, that's, that's, uh, that's the best, this is the best kind of stuff. So thank you. Thank you for all these ideas. This is terrific. And there's more. I'm not surprised. And Veronica in, uh, adds, 
Left and right, there are five circles, and around the heart, six rows of energies. And I also want to say that crown in Greek is called corona. The crown shows the head chakras may may the ability to use them. And something of today, I am wondering why the virus is called coronavirus. Huh. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, if you, you know, if you look at the pharaohs, the, um, no, gosh, what was it called? Anyway, it's that the snake ascended and, and depicted on the lower part of the crown as showing an open head center. And this, this was a particular deity uh, that I always associated with the risen Kundalini. So in the same way, the, you know, this tiara could be descriptive of illumined head centers. Uh, as to the coronavirus, you know, that's, it's a fascinating parallel idea. I have no idea what that's about. Maybe it's just because they, you know, at a microbial letter level, and I think I saw a picture of it. It's it's round, uh, this virus, and uh, so maybe they saw a corona in there. Anyone else want to roll here? Lorraine confirms that coronavirus is named based upon its appearance. It appears to have a crown around it. Yeah, okay. Good. Group think. That's great. And Lynn writes, and the symbols of North and South Node look like the Aidan Moran. Oh, yeah, they do. Yeah, yeah. That was brought up by Jonathan. Now that it's, yeah. Right. And... Martha writes, can't help thinking of modern Catholic priests through whom the sacramental power of grace flows. Yeah, and I think there was a direct link. You know, we'll, we'll get to that a little bit. But, you know, Druidic sites like Chart, there was definitely a crossover. You know, even the virgin and child was originally Druidic. And that's not the only source. There were other virgin and child, virgin with child around the globe, it's, uh, but definitely one can be directly associated with um, um, a pre-Christian uh, shark, right? Um, what was it called? The Virgini Parture, but we're coming up on that. Um, yeah, Parature. We're able to move on now. No kidding. Okay. So, one, we read that. We were talking about the fanciful slash uh, intuitional writings. And we are here. Okay, so could we get a reader for this paragraph? Okay. Um, Trudy, could you read that for us, please? Can you hear me? Yes. According to James Gardner, there were usually two arch druids in Britain, one residing on the Isle of Anglesey and the other on the Isle of Man. Presumably, there were others in Gaul. These dignitaries generally carried golden scepters and were crowned with wreaths of oak leaves, symbolic of their authority. The younger members of the Druid, Druidic order were clean shaven and modestly dressed, but the more aged had long gray beards and wore magnificent golden ornaments. The educational system of the Druids in Britain was superior to that of other colleagues on the continent, and consequently, many of the Gallic youths were sent to the Druid, Druidic colleges in Britain for their philosophical instruction and training. Thank you. Well read. 
Any thoughts or questions about this? Here are the Isles of Anglesey and Man, home of the two Arshuids mentioned. As you can see by the map on the lower right, uh, the Isles are strategically positioned between Ireland and central England. And by the way, the term Gaul basically meant any, you know, it was originated uh, by the Rome Romans. And it was basically any anyone they hadn't conquered yet, they called the Gaul, right? It, 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 because it was not a specific region, though it's known without question that it included <clears throat> at least northern France and um, uh, other parts of Europe, but it's 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 not a a region with specific borders. But and there was very probably um, another arch druid or even more than one other in those areas, but the heart of the uh, Druidic stronghold was on these two islands. And you can see how, um, how strategically located they are between Ireland and England. Okay, next up, can we get a reading? Tia, are you able to read that please? Yes. Eliphas Levi states that the Druids lived in strict, strict abstinence, studied the natural sciences, preserved the deepest secrecy, and admitted new members only after long probationary periods. Many of the priests of the order lived in buildings not unlike the monasteries of the modern world. They were associated in groups like ascetics of the Far East. Although celibacy was not demanded of them, few married. Many of the Druids retired from the world and lived as recluses in caves, in rough stone houses, or in little shacks built in the depths of a forest. Here they prayed and meditated, emerging only to reform their religious duties. Thank you. Any thoughts or questions about this paragraph? Here are the ruins of a seaside Celtic monastery. Uh, called Skellig Michael. Um, you know, we're in in the Once and Future King. Merlin uh, was you know a main character, and he lived in in a, a minimal conditions in the deep forest. You know, um, of course, this is has nothing to do with historical Druidism, but it was certainly inspired by the Druids, right? Uh, okay, next up. Can we get a reader, please? Lynn, could you read this for us, please? Yes. James Freeman Clark, in his Ten Great Religions, describes the beliefs of the Druids as follows. <clears throat> the Druids believed in three worlds and in transmigration from one to the other. In a world above this, in which happiness predominated, a world below of misery and this present state. This transmigration was to punish and reward and also to purify the soul. In the present world, said they, good and evil are so exactly balanced that man has the utmost freedom and is able to choose or reject either. The Welsh triads tell us there are three objects of metempsychosis, to collect into the soul the properties of all being, to acquire a knowledge of all things, and to get power to conquer evil. There are also, they say, three kinds of knowledge, knowledge of the nature of each thing, of its cause and its influence. There are three things which continually grow less, darkness, falsehood, and death. There are three which constantly increase, light, life, and truth. Thanks, Lynn. Any thoughts or questions about this? Um, I'm of the opinion that this idea of uh, these three worlds is was probably a popular belief among the Celts and maybe an exoteric understanding, um, but that within the Druidic order and very possibly a secret of their um, teachings, of their um, doctrine, was um, something more along the line of the Pythagorean understanding, uh, which was 
uh, had a, a, a extended further into the causal realms than uh, than what's described here does. Anyway, it's not difficult difficult to see the influence of the ancient wisdom teachings in these beliefs, even at this level. By the way, according to Wikipedia, the Welsh triads are a group of related texts in medieval manuscripts, which preserve fragments of Welsh folklore, mythology, and traditional history in groups of three, peculiarly, that date back to the 10th century. There are dozens of these interrelated triads and a whole lot of um, uh, what we get about the Druids is, um, uh, you could say, speculatively extended from these Welsh triads. Higgins, uh, Godfrey Higgins, expand on MPH's description of Druidic metempsychosis. Could we get a reader for this? Martha G., could you read that for us, please? Sure. The Druids were firm believers in a supreme being. As I have shown in a former part of this work, and in general, held the doctrines of Pythagoras. They believed in a future state of rewards and punishments, in the immortality of the soul, and in the metempsychosis of the world's transmigration after death. From Wait, one body. Sorry, I have to correct you. Metempsychosis or the soul's transmigration after death. Thanks, Francis. And in the metempsychosis or the soul's transmigration after death from one body to another. According to Valerius Maximus, it was no unusual thing for the Gauls to lend money to be repaid again in some kind of way in another life. He says that the Druids were men of exalted genius, ranged in regular societies, who by the advice of Pythagoras raised their minds to the most sublime inquiries and despising human and worldly affairs, strongly pressed upon their disciples the immortality of the soul. Lucan says that according to the Druid opinion, the ghosts of the dead descended not to Erebus or the empire of Pluto, there to remain in a state of separation from all body as the Greeks and Romans thought, but that the same soul actuated another body in another world. Mela declares that the Druids maintained that the souls were immortal and that there was another life after this, wherein they existed among other departed ghosts, and that they did for this reason burn and inter with the dead that suited their rank and inclinations when they were alive. Their moral doctrine seemed to have been short and simple, to worship the gods, to do no evil, and to be valiant in battle. This code of moral law is very short, but it is very comprehensive. And it may be a question whether if every individual in a society acted up to these precepts, the society would not be the happiest of any that ever existed from the Celtic Druids. Thank you. And why don't you go ahead and read this footnote, which references the same soul actuated another body in another world. So read with Mela. Yeah. Mela, the geographer, says the Thracians held one of the doctrines of the Druids as a common national persuasion. And it is not improbable that they may have learned it from them, that souls, after being purified by their transmigration, attained a condition of endless felicity. Thank you. So again, the ancient wisdom teachings are, are very present in that. There was also a, a lot of commerce. I know that the Phoenicians uh, had a tin trade, T-I-N, tin trade with the, with the Druids. That's um, documented. Uh, and that, of course, there was much commerce between the Greeks and uh, um, the Britons. 
And so what's here suggested is that it could have gone both ways that, you know, the, this, the connection with Samothrace um, and Cirrus and um, was it um, another goddess, uh, which were worshiped on, on Samothrace, you know, was also worshiped in the same way on an island off of Britain. Well, here you have the possibility that the Thracians learned from the Druids, um, you know, this, um, this idea uh, about the soul, which is, from my point of view, a, a, a lot more esoteric and, and elevated than the, the Greek concept of death. Okay. Up next, can we get a, a reader for this, please? And Veronica, would you be able to read this, please? Yes. Like nearly all schools of the mysteries, the teaching of the Druids were divided into two distinct sections. The simpler and moral code was taught to all the people, while the deeper esoteric doctrine was given only to initiated priests. To be admitted to the order, a candidate was required to be of good family and of high moral character. No important secret, secrets were entrusted to him until he had been tempted in many ways and his strength of character severely tried. The Druids taught the people of Britain and Gaul concerning the immortality of the soul. They believed in the transmigration and apparently in the re reincarnation. They borrowed in one life, promising to pay back in the next. They believed in the prog prog progatorial type of hell, where they would be purged of their sins, afterwards passing on to the happiness of unity with the gods. The Druids taught that all men would be saved, but that some must return to earth many times to learn the lessons of human life and to overcome the inherent evil of their own natures. Thank you. Thank you. Any thoughts or questions about this paragraph? We see uh, this could come right out of the theosophical teachings, right? Um, and of course, by purgatorial hell, it's meant this place, you know, where you um, transform your nature until you can link with the soul at the fourth initiation. So Philip Freeman adds this uh, quote. Could we uh, get a reader, please? Trudy, could you read this for us, please? One fascinating aspect of the Celtic teaching is that the rebirth of the soul was not immediate. Many years could pass between a person's death and his next incarnation. In the meantime, the soul apparently existed in a spiritual world that could be reached through a portal opening by a fu funeral fire. The scene is a a touching one that must have been witnessed by Poseidonus many times. At the end of a funeral, those gods who had lost loved ones, children, spouses, parents, friends, walked forward one by one to place their letters on the burning pyre in the hope that their message would reach the other world. Thank you. So this is interesting. The idea that um, a ritual funeral fire would open a door between the spiritual world, um, a portal, um, and that uh, um, souls could be reached through this fascinating idea. OK, well, you know, we are at the end of our time. Um, we still have um, some some to go with the with the uh, with the druids, and so we'll pick up um, next time. And I'm sure we'll finish off this section next time uh, and get into 
uh, Mithras, uh, which is, a, um, even though it took place in a different region, Mithraism in, originated in Persia and, and uh, was practiced in Rome. Um, there are Mithraic uh, archaeological sites, um, certainly around uh, Chart and even in England. So they're in, interleaved and also connected in terms of of their time periods. So, um, okay, so that's it for today. It's it's uh, my lucky privilege to be able to host these webinars and um, I appreciate you, uh, your contributions and your attendance. So until next time, um, we'll see you then. Oh, by the way, uh, before you sign up, let's get an announcement for the next webinar, which will be a secret doctrine webinar, um, which will be on the third Sunday of this month. Uh, can you pull, somebody pull that up, what that date uh, is? The, the secret doctrine webinar is on Sunday the 16th at 8 p.m. GMT. Okay. And the next, uh, the next webinar of this series is on March 1st, Sunday, March 1st at 8 p.m. GMT. Okay, so um, hope to see you all on the 16th, uh, if you're following both. Uh, if not, then the, the next webinar will be on the 1st. So until then, thank you very much. See you later. <laughs>